Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Haida Hackman and as CEO of the International Science Council, I am honored to formally open this webinar on behalf of both the Council and the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, EASA. A very warm word of welcome and thanks to our partners in today's event, the governments of Norway and South Africa, to our advisory board members and patron, and to all our online participants for joining today's discussion on transformations towards a so-called new normal. Thinking about the new normal impels all of us to think about processes of profound change, change at the personal level, as well as change to the socioeconomic, political, cultural, and technological systems that form the basis of today's unsustainable, unequal, and, and increasingly unstable, risky global ecology. The very idea of societies evolving, whether they like it or not, towards a new normal provide science with a powerful opportunity and a responsibility to help set an agenda for change. And in doing so, to ensure that science inspires and informs global policy and public attention away from continued talk about the need for transformation towards concrete action in urgent pursuit of it. The IASA ISC consultative platform was designed to respond to that opportunity to learn from this moment of global crisis in order to bring robust and actionable scientific knowledge to bear in support of the work of decision makers and practitioners who now have to grapple with the work of recovery, with building back better or bouncing forward sustainably in ways that build resilience to systemic shocks and that shift the needle once and for all on society's pursuit of the 2030 Agenda for Global Sustainable Development. For the first phase of our work, the initial results of which will be presented to you today, we chose to focus on identifying transformations within REACH in four critical systems, food and energy, governance and science. Our approach was to mobilize knowledge and expertise from within and beyond the global scientific community, engaging thought leaders and decision makers from policy, the private sector, and wider publics in a global network of transformative dialogue, mutual learning, and problem solving. Colleagues, COVID-19 has thrown a spotlight on the role of science in society in ways that are unprecedented in our lifetimes. And science has, for better or for worse, stepped into that spotlight boldly and bravely with rapid responses from across the spectrum of scientific fields and from scientific communities from all parts of the world. The message of transformation is consistent across most of this work, and it has been ampl amplified recently in the development of a UN research roadmap for recovery from the pandemic. The potential and the appetite for transformation and the recognition of the role of science may never be this great again. In this context, IASA and IASC are committed to further building the community of expertise we have convened and to ensure that we foster meaningful international scientific collaboration towards a new normal that safeguards resilience, justice, and equity for all. On that note, colleagues, let me hand over to Professor Lena Srivastava, Deputy Direct Director General of IASA, who will be moderating the rest of today's discussion. Lena, we thank you and all the members of the EASA and ISC team for the tremendous work that has been put into our joint endeavor. Over to you, Lena. Thank you very much, Heidi, for the excellent introduction and setting the stage and for the great partnership. Uh, in addition to the partners and collaborators that you have already acknowledged, I would like to thank our initiative partners, the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, Future Earth, Earth League, and the Vienna Energy Forum. The chairs of the four themes that uh, Heide spoke about and the nearly 300 experts that we engage with over the last three months. I would particularly like to acknowledge the key role played by Her Excellency Mary Robinson in this particular initiative. Before we go to our next intervention, I would like to urge all the participants to think about two key questions as you listen to our speakers. The first is, who are the key actors and what are the key actions which will help realize these transformations within REACH, which we will be presenting? And the second is, how would you influence or suggest we influence 
these actors. Uh, I will now invite the presentation from His Excellency Dag Inge Ulstein, Minister of International Development of Norway. Secretary General, Madam President, Excellencies, we are living in challenging times and we need facts more than ever, real facts about real problems. Climate change, COVID-19, conflict, poverty, hunger, and loss of jobs and biodiversity. Not least, we need facts that connect the dots between these challenges. We must be conscious of these connections and we have to act on the facts. If science is to evolve from being a provider of knowledge to a provider of solutions, we need policymakers who listen. The report being launched today, Transformations Within Reach, is thorough and thought-provoking. It is an excellent example of the scientific community's commitment to strategic collaboration in order to advance the use of evidence in global policy, discourse and action. If the pandemic has thought us anything, it is the following. Collective human behaviour matters. Science matters, governments matters, and compassion matters. In fact, compassion and cooperation go hand in hand with self-interests. The report tells us that the response to the coronavirus has had its positives and negatives. The positive that stood out earlier was the strong role of national governments. They took bold action to stem the spread of the disease in the absence of vaccine protocols and understanding. However, these governments often fail to work together. Parts of the cooperation have functioned well. Various other parts have simply collapsed. The report clearly shows the need to reform the United Nations system. It has to be modernized and enabled to respond to current and emerging global challenges. Another key positive was a host of business innovations and changes in lifestyle choices. It is imperative that we seize upon these achievements as opportunities to embark upon a more conscious, equitable and sustainable path of future development. If we manage to get a COVID-19 vaccine ready by early 2021, it will be a massive victory for science. It will also be thanks to governments and organizations that for decades have promoted global health and vaccination as major tools in the strate strategies to fight poverty. It proves a simple fact of which I am particularly fond. Helping others is not only a duty, but also a way of helping yourself. If we manage to secure a fair distribution of the vaccine, allowing it to reach the poorest and the weakest. It will also be a major step towards fighting poverty and reaching the 2030 goals. And this is what Norway aims to do as co-chair of the Facilitation Council for the new mechanism called ACT Accelerator. This is how we meet the pandemic, by realizing that it is not our only problem. It is an amplifier of old problems and a potential precursor to future problems. Responding to COVID-19 gives us opportunities to take action that will enable the world to take a leap towards sustainability. Let us address climate change and the extreme inequalities of the world and resist return to old patterns and pathways. It is time to introduce game-changing measures that will help us build a more equitable and sustainable world to build back better, fairer, greener, and more scientific, to act on facts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your ex uh, Excellency, uh, Minister Alstein. Uh, as I think everyone is aware, we have two sponsors for the webinar that we are organizing today. One is the government of Norway, and one is the government of South Africa. Uh, Minister Alstein you know, gave a very profound statement, helping others is a way of helping yourself. And I think that is a key for us to go forward, cooperation and partnerships. May I now invite Dr. Phil 
uh, Mushwaka, Director General of the Department of Science and Innovation in South Africa, one of our sponsors, to share his thoughts with us. Dr. Mushwaka. Thank you very much, uh, Lena, um, for the opportunity that uh, you've given us as South Africa to have a few uh, words. And I would like to start by apologizing that uh, the minister could not be um, in this uh, webinar because of other engagements. So he sends his sincere apologies. So science, uh, technology, and innovation played and continues to play a decisive role uh, in the fight against COVID-19. And through drug and vaccine development will provide us with the instruments to decisively defeat the pandemic. Science, technology, and innovation will also act as a catalyst towards a transition of society into a new normal post COVID-19, a world which should be more just equitable. South Africa is thus proud to be associated with this side event presented by partners with whom we have long-standing collaboration, the government of Norway, the International Science Council, and the International Institute for Applied uh, Systems Analysis. Even in the midst of COVID-19 storm, science, technology, and innovation funding should remain a priority to ensure that countries, especially the developing countries, are prepared and ready for new ways of life post COVID-19. The 2020 UNCTAD policy brief on science, technology, and innovation emphasizes the need for governments to continue these investments during the period of COVID-19. However, investments alone will not be enough, and we also have to ensure agile and enabling policy frameworks are in place. Therefore, platforms such as the EASA ISC Bouncing Forward Sustainability post COVID-19 play an important role in knowledge and information brokerage as we seek to address key societal challenges such as food and energy security. Addressing these, as well as other objectives of the platform, namely the strengthening of science system and responsive governance require us to advance and embrace open science agenda. We are convinced that measures to advance open science will permit us to optimally harness the potential of science to achieve the ambition for transition to a more just sustainable world uh, that we are looking for. This will include open access, in other words, open access to science, technology, and innovation results, open data, in other words, the open sharing of research data, which is crucial given the data intensity of research, as well as making sure science is open to society and that all of society is involved as an active actor in the scientific enterprise. South Africa is actively committed to work with international forums to advance open science as we strongly support the development of the UNESCO recommendation on open science. South Africa is also hosting the African Open Science Platform, an initiative that is supported by the ISC. These are certainly resources we can contribute to, uh, to the work of the Bouncing Forward Platform. We live at a time of technological change that is unprecedented in its pace, scope, and depth of impact. Harnessing that progress is the surest path for the international community to deliver on the 2030 agenda for people, peace, and prosperity. Frontier technologies hold the promise to revive productivity and make resources available to end poverty for, food, for good, enable more sustainable patterns of growth, and mitigate or even reverse decades of environmental degradation. South Africa has a number of flagship science, technology, initiatives which contributes to these objectives. I'd like to share with you a few of these. The first example is our national bioeconomy strategy and agricultural research programs through which investment in the development of drought and disease resistance crops um, have been made. And this is aimed at enhancing national and regional food security. 
Food security depends also on science-based decision-making. And in this regard, the earth observation data has a crucial role to play. It is in this area where international partnerships, such as the Group on Earth Observation, popularly known as GEO, and one of its initiative called the Global Agricultural Monitoring uh, is an important initiative and will continue uh, to play an important role. On the energy security, our priority here in South Africa is investment that has been main, made in the domain of hydrogen and fuel cell technology. Hydrogen fuel cell technologies not only provide us with affordable and reliable solutions to bolster our energy security, but also stimulate economic growth, growth through the beneficiation of raw materials, such as platinum, which we have in abundance. But technological change and innovation needs to be directed towards inclusive and sustainable outcomes through a purposeful effort by governments in collaboration with civil society, business, and academia. If policymakers are not proactive, technological disruption can entrench inequality, further marginalize the poorest, and fuel reactionary movements against open societies and economies. Understanding inequality, poverty, and unemployment, especially through investment in the social sciences, is therefore also at the heart of our national research agenda. Technological change is also becoming exponential as a result of the power of digital platforms and innovative combinations of different technologies that become possible every day. This opens exciting possibilities for the democratization of frontier technologies to materialize in developing solutions. To achieve the technological change, research and technological infrastructure become more important as they recognize key elements in research and innovation policies for boosting scientific knowledge generation, accelerating technology development, enhancing both technological and social innovation, and for providing advanced scientific training for new generation of scientists and science managers. Therefore, developing countries need to invest in research and technological infrastructure to be able to translate their research into goods and services. International cooperation is also more important to assist the developing countries to leapfrog and attempt to catch up with the already advanced developed countries. Despite significant growth in numbers of researchers in developing countries, they are very unevenly distributed around the world relative to population with disproportionate numbers in Europe and North America. In 2014, for an example, there were over 1,098 researchers per million people globally, but only 87.9 per million in Sub-Saharan Africa and 63.4 per million in least developing countries. These figures sketch the important challenge we have to join force through events such as the one that we are addressing today. In developing countries with nascent innovation systems, most actors need first to develop a basic capacity to learn how to adopt, assimilate, and diffuse existing knowledge and technologies. This is an essential requirement for technology transfer, which is a complement to, not substitute for, efforts building endogenous innovation potential. In conclusion, I would like to submit the following recommendations to boost innovation capacity in developing countries. Firstly, the regulatory and policy framework, which should provide a stable and predictable environment to facilitate long-term planning by firms and other innovating innovation actors. Secondly, the institutional setting and governance, which should be oriented towards incentivizing actors to invest in productive rather than rent-seeking activities. Thirdly, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, which should provide flexible access to finance through appropriate accessible financial instruments, together with organizational capabilities and managerial competencies. Fourthly, human capital, including both the technical and managerial skills involved in innovation activities. And fifthly, the development of a technical and R&D infrastructure. I would 
again like to congratulate EASA and ISC on this important initiative. We are proud that we can call both Dr. Heidi Hackman and Professor Albert van Jarsveld, a daughter and son of South Africa. Their leadership of these organizations symbolizes also South Africa's commitment to advance the global sustainable agenda through science, technology, and innovation. We look forward to continue to do so, especially in cooperation with a historic and strategic partner, such as the government of Norway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, and for the very sharp focus that you provided on the role of science, technology, and innovation. Um, I'm sure this will get taken up quite a bit. Uh, we are now privileged to have uh, uh, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, former Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, sharing his thoughts with us. He is, as you may be aware, the patron of the IASA ISC Consultative Science Platform, and, and we are honored to have him uh, in that position. Thank you very much. Let me thank IASA and ISC for having taken this initiative to convene some 200 scientists, experts, and policymakers from every region of the world to deliberate on one of the most extraordinary challenges in modern times. Thanks, Norway, and Your Excellency Minister Dag Inge Ulstein, Mr. Phil Mujirawar from South Africa, dear friend Mary Robinson, Mrs. Heide Hackman, CEO of ISC, and Albert van Jasfeld, IASA Director General, for today's event. Our question over the past month was, how can we introduce game-changing measures that will help us build a more equitable and sustainable world after COVID. The approach taken was unique and effective. The effort looked at solutions, involved practitioners to assess on their viability, and policymakers to deliberate on ways to make these recommendations happen. But the merit of these consultations was not to concentrate on the negative effects which the pandemic is causing across all the regions of the world, but rather to see this as an extraordinary opportunity for innovations and transformations. These consultations aimed at shining a light on the lessons learned uh, during the past five months by preserving the positive and mitigating the negative. For example, we boldly asked the question if some of the current stimulus packages could be used to bring about some of these necessary positive transformations, we all see the urgency of acting in this small window of opportunity that we have now. The various consultations focused on transformations that would be necessary for achieving a more sustainable and equal world. Given what we have witnessed during these past few months, one of the major themes of the consultations was the urgency to address equity and justice. It was fairly evident that this pandemic did not affect everyone equally. Those who had the facility to work from home through virtual means were fortunate. Unfortunately, this does not include a major portion of the population around the world whose jobs were severely affected. Many things have been revealed during this period, 
the inadequacy of our governance systems, the unequal impact that the pandemic is causing, particularly on the poor and the weak systems for predicting, preventing, and addressing risks. This includes the inadequacy of safety nets for weathering the crisis. And most importantly, it has made noticeably clear the importance of international cooperation in science, innovation, and technology, areas where there is a major divide among the rich and the poor countries. We have learned that countries and societies which had the means to quickly adapt, often through digital means, maneuvered through the crisis without much damage. Many of the solutions are technological indeed, but also social, as for example, in the cases of cities which have reorganized their urban space to make their cities more livable during the pandemic. The centrality of science has also been demonstrated and recognized. Unfortunately, this is one area where major efforts are required to build the capacities at the local levels, particularly in poor developing countries where these capaci capacities are weak and in some cases non-existent. Science is key to peace, prosperity, and sustainability. An enabling environment needs to be created for young researchers and scientists to have the opportunity to contribute to the advancement of science in their societies. Today, this possibility is almost non-existent and as such, it is an urgent area to address. And this is where international cooperation has a major role to play. Addressing the challenges that COVID-19 has brought requires multidisciplinary approaches and solutions that require societies to work together. It requires global citizenship as our mindset in our actions and reflected in our values. And policymakers need to design their policies based on science. Strengthening the system for a seamless science policy, society interface is crucial for success, not only in addressing this pandemic, but all the multidimensional challenges of our time leaving no one behind. Let us work together for a better world for all. Thank you. Thank you, Shen. Thank you very much uh, to His Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, for a very comprehensive analysis of the situation we find ourselves in and for highlighting the fact that COVID-19 is holding a mirror up to the world, uh, an opportunity to redress and the great initiatives that are already taking place amongst many others. I would now like to invite Her Excellency Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, chair of the elders, patron of the International Science Council and chair of the advisory board of the EASA ISC consultative science platform to do us the honor of sharing some select insights from this initiative. Uh, Your Excellency. Good morning. I'd like to build on the inspiring message of my fellow elder, Ban Ki-moon. As you've heard, a global science-led multi-sectoral consultation process has started with a view to harnessing the key learnings of the pandemic world in which we currently live, with the aim of prioritizing areas for transformative action that can address the complex challenges that lie ahead. 
Basically, recovery presents us with two broad alternatives, reverting back to business as usual, or transformation towards a resilient, just, and sustainable future. A, the risks associated with business as usual are very real. The SDGs Paris Agreement are likely out of reach. Business as usual will mean more inequality, increases in poverty and hunger, potential for conflict over resources, vulnerability to future pandemics, economic environmental risks, and even political instability. Business as usual is not a real option. It would further lock in an unsustainable pathway towards tipping points of cascading crises. B, the rewards associated with transformations within reach are a more equitable, resilient, and robust society living within planetary boundaries. A resilient and sustainable future requires international collaboration, solidarity, fiscal support to advance a more equitable society, strengthening social safety nets, enabling an environment of retraining new skills with a focus on green and inclusive economy. Whilst not a viable option, and despite much talk about transformation, business as usual remains a very likely scenario, meaning that we have to become far more effective in understanding where opportunities for transformation lie and what it will take to respond to them. And that is what the IIASA ISC initiative is intended to support. Within the above context, the four themes of the IIASA ISC consultation were distinguished as follows. Governance, science systems, energy, and food. The guiding principles and key elements for the recovery process emerging from the consultations are, humanity has unleashed extreme, multiple, and compounding risks upon itself, which we must prepare for, including building resilience in dealing with non-linear system outcomes. We must address these risks through systems thinking, with an emphasis on delivering multiple dividends. The focus should sh shift towards resilience and sustainability based on equity and justice as essential foundations of future economic, social, and environmental development as mirrored in the 2030 Agenda. Collaboration, transparency, fairness, and evidence-informed policymaking are critical ingredients. The past few months have also shown outstanding examples of individual and community-based initiatives projects and programs bringing new actors to the forefront who engage as global citizens whose response is shaped by their local contexts. So turning to the thematic headlines and highlights, the consultation with governance found that current governance arrangements are inadequate to protect global and local commons. COVID-19 has shown that socio-ecological -eco trends bring us to a world that is increasingly risk prone, in addition to being unequal and unsustainable. Learning how intertwined human and natural systems are and how a local threat can quickly become a global crisis, the consultations with leading experts, advisors, and policymakers have shown that realizing sustainable development is an imperative to reduce risk, build resilience, and secure long term development gains. Areas of action and transformation suggested from the governance consultations include a reforming and repurposing global institutions to enhance global governance in an ever riskier world. An international system based on specialized agencies all competing for resources is increasingly unfit to respond to today's interconnected problems. B boosting awareness and understanding of compound and systemic risks across governance arrangements at all scales is one key area of transformation needed to meet today's global and complex challenges. C, strengthening governance in national systems by making systemic resilience and sustainability a core collective government priority. Accountability and transparency provisions have to be built into more integrated governance arrangements. D, building forward rather than back by ensuring shorter term COVID recovery packages integrate sustained investments into SDGs and SDG wide resilience and lead to longer term transformations. 
Two, the consultation into science systems found that science systems are in urgent need of strengthening and reform. Five major transformations are suggested to move the science system to a new frontier of agility, reliability, and policy relevance. One of the main challenges is to build urgently local institutional capacity for research and scientific advice where it is most limited. Areas for transformative action include A, strengthening transdisciplinary research and networking on critical risks and systems resilience at local, at global, regional, and national levels. B, enhancing the diffusion of scientific knowledge within the science system. C, improving the quality and efficacy of the science policy interface at national, regional, and global levels. D, enhancing communication of scientific knowledge, public understanding, and trust in science. E, increasing the capacity of the science system to respond in a more agile fashion to challenges emanating from a glo global crisis while simultaneously ensuring the quality and rigor of science output. output. Three, the consultation into energy found that COVID-19 reinforced how energy should be considered as an enabler and therefore, along with the greening of energy supply, energy demand reductions must be aggressively sought through interventions in the consuming sectors. COVID-19 has revealed multiple vulnerabilities, including the direct and indirect implications for the demand for and growth of clean energy. Three areas of transformative action with game-changing implications for energy could substantially contribute to climate and sustainable development goals while building a greater resilience in the energy system. A, reinventing urban spaces, infrastructure, and mobility. We have seen the potential of remote working, digitalization, innovations in business models, redesign of workspaces and uses, and the creation of an enabling environment for reorganizing urban spaces and facilities, including buildings and roads. B, redirecting consumption of goods and services through the design of incentive and regulatory systems that would advance a, a circular and sharing economy with active citizen engagement. And C, advancing a decentralized and locally resourced energy system accompanied by aggressive energy efficiency. Four, the consultation on food security found that the humanitarian and socioeconomic crisis triggered by the pandemic revealed multiple systemic and structural vulnerabilities and interdependencies embedded in our current food systems. The evolution of food systems has largely been driven by efficiency concerns. The recovery process should be focused on counterbalancing efficiency with an emphasis on resilience and equity to ensure the capacity of food systems to deliver food and nutritional security to the most vulnerable. We must reconfigure supply chains supply chains and trade dependencies based on an evaluation of their likely capacity to absorb and adapt to socioeconomic and environmental shocks. We must expand the benefits, reach and duration of social safety nets and allow people employed informally a pathway to join social security structures to mitigate the impact of future unemployment stroke crisis situations. The areas for action and transformative change include A, reorient food systems architecture from increased production and efficiency to resilience and equity. B, making human and planetary health concerns an integral component of food systems. We have to shift towards affordable, healthy, and environmentally sustainable diets, transferring costs to unhealthy and unsustainable diets. C, facilitating access to innovative and technology diffusion and the acceleration and upscaling of sustainable practices. So in conclusion, COVID-19 reminds us we live in a non-linear complex world of interdependence between natural and human systems. This pandemic is a warning. We need to step away from business as usual into new transformative pathways that get us on track to reach the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement commitments. And we need to become better prepared and more resilient 
to protect ourselves from future systemic shocks at all levels of global governance. The COVID-19 response has shown that some policymakers can act quickly and populations have shown that decisive individual action can lead to a new collective consciousness to mitigate risk and enable living within planetary boundaries. We could call this an emergent collective consciousness, a philosophy of global citizenship that ensures we develop safety nets and resilient systems that address the ambition of a just and equitable global society. Transformations are within reach, but require global collaboration and fact-based decision-making. We want to use our knowledge gained through the consultations and the pandemic experience to emphasize the importance of developing a global coalition of the willing to strengthen our ability to develop a resilient approach to collective action in the face of future compound risks. Pursuing the required transformations will require new types of partnerships between governments, civil society, the public and the private sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, for so succinctly and elegantly illustrating the transformations that are within reach and also sharing with us your thoughts on how we can move forward in actually achieving these transformations. Uh, there is a slide that we have uh, to illustrate some of the key points. Uh, we cannot summarize a speech like that, but hopefully this will help you uh, look at some of the key uh, elements of what was contained in, in Mary's speech. I'm not going to read through them in the interest of time, but I hope you will find it of some use. Now let's move on. Uh, the private sector is a key stakeholder in the transformations towards sustainability, as well as those within reach and would need to engage constructively with this effort. I would now like to invite Mr. Peter Barker, President of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, to make his intervention. Peter. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, IASA and ISC, for the great efforts to bring together the scientists, practitioners, policymakers at this important moment in, in history. Uh, it's an honor for me to speak to all of you as a member of the advisory board. Um, and as a representative, as said, of the private sector. Uh, as you've heard from the speakers before me, we've heard the many challenges that we face, as well as the great opportunity to build forward better. This will require transformations. And therefore the topic of today, transformations within reach have been well chosen. I would actually argue it doesn't only require transformations, it requires transformation of the whole systems. Um, let me first say that a number of speakers have said we cannot return to business as usual. It has to work business in it. So let me confirm that from the business sector, there is no intent nor viable route to return to business as usual. We need to build forward better. And in order to do that, we need to transform the systems in which we all operate. The focus in those transformations has to be on resolving climate change, avoiding further loss of nature and actually having a positive impact on nature. And last, but certainly not least, taking a hard look at inequality and improving the situation there. As I said, this will require system transformation. The energy system needs to transform to a fully decarbonized system. The food system needs to provide affordable, healthy diets produced within the boundaries of the planet. And last but not least, the governance or the economic system itself has to change. The role of business in all of these transformations is very clear. We need to listen to science and translate science into science-based targets that become actionable. Against those science-based targets, we need to deploy business capabilities in innovation, in developing new technology solutions, but also, as Mary said, in changing the business models. And last but not least, business needs to deploy its capabilities to quickly scale up those solutions new technologies and new business models. And science plays an essential role in these transformations. 
Let me give you the example of climate. Only 10 years ago, there were lots of discussions about what would climate action require. The Paris Agreement introduced the two degrees as a science-based target for climate action. Now, five years later, the norm has shifted. We need to stay below one and a half degrees, which is translated into we need to be net zero by 2050. In the midst of the COVID crisis, we have seen more and more companies commit to being decarbonized or net zero by 2050. Actually, a race to the top has started, and we see now companies even commit to net zero by 2030. We need to develop the same science-based targets for the food system transformation. Not all of these targets are there for the nature loss agenda. We're now pushing hard for global goals for nature, but we will need these to transfer them into science-based targets that business can respond to. But last and certainly not least, essential actually, we need to attack the economic system itself. In the world of business, we're saying the days of shareholder capitalism are behind us. We can no longer reach a built forward better economy if we continue to only optimize the financial capital. We must integrate natural capital and social capital into what we call performance. The cost of more sustainable businesses, the cost of capital for more sustainable businesses should be lower than that for unsustainable businesses. And this requires a fundamental reset of economy theories and therefore of economic science. So I'm very happy to contribute to this advisory board. Science is going to be an essential guide to where we need to be. Science-based targets will mobilize business to really build forward better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, may I, uh, well, I wanted to remind the participants of key questions, but I think we have a very robust uh, dialogue that is going on already uh, in the chat box as well as in the Q&A session. Uh, and obviously we're not going to have enough time to address all of those. What I would propose to do is to uh, summarize a few of the key questions that have been coming from the audience uh, for the benefit of our panel. And uh, if you agree, what I would do is just uh, read out three or four questions and open it up to the panel members to see how they would like to respond. Uh, the first question that I have on my list is on the role of the United Nations in assisting developing countries to recover from COVID. Uh, the second question in a summarized form is how do we move from a high level reflection of what needs to be done to concrete action? How do we make that happen? Uh, how do we include citizens in the solution cycle? And why is it that we sell hope, but not followed by actions? This is just the first set. Uh, I'll open it up to all the panelists for any reflections you might have uh, on, on these questions. Um, May I invite any of the panelists? Can I request you to please switch on your videos to the panelists and, uh, and then you know, indicate if you would like to go first. And maybe I can request uh, Mary to, uh, to take the first shot at any of these questions uh, that, that you would like to. Well, I think you know, the United Nations uh, is faced with a huge problem in coping with COVID-19 at the moment, on top of all the other uh, issues and responsibilities. And I think it's it's important that as well as seeing, you know, we, we saw a million deaths today, which the Secretary General rightly described as, you know, a, a terrible um, moment for the world. But there are also lessons from COVID that I think they, the, the UN needs to build on. One of those is that collective human behavior actually matters because it's the only thing 
saving us from the virus at the moment because we have no uh, vaccine. Uh, when we come to this transformation, collective behavior will have to be very significant in less waste, more recycling, uh, less consumption, a more um, acknowledgement of the importance of the green transition to green jobs, all of that, you know, a willingness to move in that direction. Secondly, government matters. That's really important and we need to emphasize it. Thirdly, happily, science matters. I want, when we come out of this, as we come out of COVID, that um, as well as listening to the health experts to help us to deal with COVID, we listen to the climate scientists moving forward and to all science, the science that, you know, the, the, the lessons that are coming through in this uh, collaborative work that's going on. And uh, the fourth issue is a more subtle one. It is that compassion matters. Uh, we're all out of our comfort zone because of COVID. We're seeing that it's not equal. It exacerbates the inequalities. It's brown and black and indigenous who are more affected. It shows us the links between all of the inequalities, whether it's racism or poverty or gender, etc. And we are more affected now because we're all disrupted um, by COVID to the need for solidarity. I, I'm, I'm more hopeful that we will move forward because uh, we've, we've been reflecting from a different place because of COVID. Thank you very much, Mary. Would any of the others uh, like to, yes, Albert, please. And if you can also, there's another question that I would like to pose to you, which is a question from the audience once again, which says, how do we include citizens in the solution cycle? So if you would like to address yourself to that, Albert. Will do. Mary, I just quickly want to respond to the issue of how do we deal with the issues that emerge from COVID as far as uh, recovery, particularly if the developing countries are concerned. I think uh, the UN is going to find it difficult to do it, but there are agencies, of course, that are well positioned to make any, um, a difference in the space. The IMF and the World Bank are already doing so, and I think are engaging with very many governments because we understand the impact sovereign debts across the globe as a consequence of COVID. But I think what's important in that effort is that the right signals need to be incorporated into those arrangements and, and uh, discussions with national governments about the developmental trajectories that they like to put in place. I think Peter Bucker summarized those very adequately and very succinctly, but I think it's important that uh, those agencies adopt these kinds of messages in their engagements. Otherwise, we certainly will be building in the wrong direction and uh, that's very really important. Secondly, about citizens, I'll just quickly respond. Um, I think we at EASA feel strongly that the democratization of science is critically important in order for the science agenda to take its rightful place in the international landscape. Uh, if citizens don't understand why evidence is important and why scientific investigation is going to add value to our decision making and to our policy making process, um, politicians will discard and ignore evidence as long as society allows them to do so. And it's important that society needs to hold them accountable and that requires an informed citizenship that can engage with that. We encourage citizens to get involved in many citizen science initiatives. We encourage uh, people to participate in uh, efforts to collect data and information that can strengthen and improve the science across the globe. I think all those efforts uh, should be encouraged and should be expanded and should be, uh, will, allow, will make, forge a very important link between performing research in support of policy, but at the same time taking the public participation part with us uh, in the process. Thank you very much. Uh, may I direct a question then towards Peter uh, for any, with anything else that you might want to add, Peter? The question is that, uh, transdisciplinary approaches, uh, you know, pose a huge challenge. Uh, and how can communities of practice be incentivized uh, to take transdisciplinary approaches? So, in addition to anything that you might want to say, if you would like to speak to this briefly, yeah. Now, I was going to react on how can we get citizens of the world involved in the conversation. I think, uh, from a business point of view, the real battle going forward will be. Uh, if we uh, identify citizens as consumers, what can we do to provide better choices for the consumers 
and what can we do to educate them when they make their choices of consumption? So what is a healthier food, a more sustainable produced food? And how can we help consumers make those choices? Because at the end of the day, business responds best when demand changes. And, and we need to do uh, play a more proactive role. I think uh, the interdisciplinary is always a, an interesting and difficult question. Uh, but I think the SDG framework helps us think through the strategies, the interdependencies and the choices in these strategies. And that's the way I see many of the businesses now move forward. Uh, only two years ago, a company would talk about climate change here, about circular economy there. Now you begin to see companies saying, if we go circular in our production systems, we will actually be able to, to reduce emissions by a third of what our potential is in the product innovation. So you begin to see the businesses make these links inside them. Um, I think that's, that's where the answers will lie. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm afraid that we have run out of time for further questions, uh, but would like to encourage everyone to engage with us. Uh, I would finally like to invite uh, Albert von Piaswell, DG of IASA, to share his thoughts and uh, to help us uh, see the way forward from here. Albert, over to you. Thank you, Lena. Um, from my side, first of all, I'd like to thank um, everybody at IASA and the ISC that have contributed to this exercise so far. I'd like to thank uh, our panelists today, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, His Excellency Mary Robinson, and His Excellency Doug Inger Ulstein, uh, Dr. Phil Matrocha, uh, Peter Bakker, as well as the teams and all the consultations uh, that have taken place and everybody that participated in those, as well as all the webinar participants today and in the past. We really appreciate your collective effort to bring these products to bear. Uh, our intention uh, from IASA and ISC is to make sure that these initial reports will be available on the IASA and ISC websites uh, by the last quarter of 2020. I'd also like to inform you that our plan together with ISC is to continue this work way beyond the initial publication of the, uh, the, the key findings uh, to ensure that we continue uh, strengthening our work in terms, terms of uh, making sure that these transformations we're talking about become a reality uh, for us. In order to do so, um, we, in the next cycle, which will probably stretch over an 18 month, 18 month period or so beyond this year, we're gonna be focusing on uh, deepening the analytical basis for the suggested areas of action from these reports uh, in order to make sure that we can precipitate some of these transformations and defining in the same process some of the pathways that are required for the successful delivery of the transformations. We want to also make sure that we continuously engage with the entire community that we've established in this consultation process thus far uh, to have a dynamic engagement process with them towards developing uh, potential implementation plans uh, for these transformations into the future. Thinking about what is required in order to successfully deliver on this very ambitious project uh, from IASA, I think there are a couple of um, key elements that have been raised by some of the earlier speakers that I would just like to highlight. The first is that our approach must be to act now and to act decisively. The compound risks that we face uh, can very easily overwhelm us um, if we don't act decisively and if we leave them unattended. And so as a global society, we need to be more responsive and be more agile in terms of dealing with some of these risks when they emerge. Mary emphasized very strongly the need for collective human action and how that is a fundamental requirement for a better future for all of us. This also means that multilateral engagements uh, should be strengthened across the world. Uh, and this is a challenge in our current political climate, as we're all aware, but we cannot afford to give up the fight. Uh, multilateralism is going to be a key component for establishing this coalition of the willing that Mary spoke about. And third key element for me is that underpinning everything that we do in this regard, um, we should be underpinned by a shared value system of global citizenship. 
in order to allow us to deliver on a dignified future for all. I think it's really important that we take these uh, issues very seriously and hopefully these reports will give us a path forward in terms of delivering on these very ambitious uh, objectives. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of you uh, on behalf of the ISC and uh, IASA for attending and we look forward to the next set of engagements. Lena, thank you to you. Back to you. Thank you very much, Albert. And let me, on behalf of the leadership team of, of this uh, initiative, uh, Flavia Schegel and Louis uh, Eschewery uh, from IASA, uh, thank you all once again. We do have a couple of poll questions which will not take more than 30 seconds of your time. So if you can help us by responding to those, uh, it would be wonderful. Anastasia, would you mind putting it up? Okay, uh, Anastasia, so these are the results that we have. So thank you very much for sharing this with us. I think it will inform our, uh, our uh, uh, you know, recommendations as we are going forward. Um, and with this, once again, thank you all very much for participating in this webinar. Can we have the last slide, please? Uh, basically giving you where you can get in touch with us and follow up with the reports that will be coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, thank you for keeping in touch. Thank you for reading our newsletters and thank you for continuing to engage with us and giving us your guidance. Thank you very much. <laughs>